Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Great energy in the room tonight. I, I'm, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I want to welcome you to Channel Islands National Park. Um, it's a really exciting time for the park right now. Uh, I'm Ethan McKinley. I'm superintendent here. Uh, we have former superintendent Russell Gallipo here. We have a star-studded cast of folks um, here to present to you tonight on uh, one of the more interesting archaeological and uh, finds at the park. Um, and uh, an amazing story to follow it. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, introduce you to the lecture series here, um, tell you where the restrooms are, which are outside and to the right. Um, the uh, parking lots uh, should not be locked until 9 p.m., uh, but I wouldn't wait, along too, or, or wait too long afterwards to find out. Um, if a locked gate is encountered on the visitor center side of the harbor, there are signs that will direct you to a night exit. Uh, during the Q&A portion of tonight's presentation, please wait for the microphone to be brought to you uh, before you ask your question. Uh, that way everyone can hear your question and uh, we can bring it back for the response as well. Uh, each lecture is recorded and is available soon afterwards on the park website. Uh, so uh, Joss will be recording from the room up there. Um, upcoming lectures will include my presentation here on March 5th. Uh, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the 40th National Park in the country and uh, we are really excited about it. So I hope you do come to that. Uh, we'll be talking all about uh, the, pa the past of the park, uh, what we've accomplished to date, uh, what we're excited about right now, and where we're heading in the future. I want to take a moment to uh, thank the uh, Chumash tribe uh, for being here. Uh, we are uh, a park uh, service that's been here since 1938. Um, their people have been here for thousands of years, and I feel like we're carrying on a tradition of stewardship um, that uh, is a very special uh, relationship between us and the tribe. Um, and one cannot really understand the history of the Channel Islands without a full appreciation of the history of the Chumash people. Um, so tonight, I hope you'll uh, take some time to learn more about the tribe and uh, really listen in on how this interaction happens between uh, the, the current stewards of this land um, who are looking out for it uh, all the time, uh, the National Park Service and the Chumash people. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to welcome uh, this, from the Santa Inez uh, Band, uh, Dolores Cross as an elder, and Antonio Flores, also an elder, uh, Kathy Marshall and Nakia Zavala. Um, I, is Jun Julia Tumamaya here? I didn't see her tonight. Okay, all right, well, I'd welcome her as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our very uh, experienced, very capable Chief of Cultural Resources and Chief Diplomat here to the Chumash people uh, from the Channel Islands National Park, Laura Kern. Thank you. Hi everybody, Ethan, thanks for introducing all of us and, and I just wanted to share his his sentiment that we're very honored to have the Chumash elders and other Chumash spokespeople here tonight to share your story of um, a really important aspect of the history of, of the Channel Islands. Um, uh, tonight, uh, I'll, I have the pleasure of introducing Nakia Zavala to you all. She's, she's the spokesperson for the tribe tonight. Ms. Zavala is a descendant of the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians. She's been the culture and language director for the tribe since 2007. She manages all aspects of the cultural department, including cultural programs, language, and public cultural education. She's grown up in her tribe's traditional ways, and she brings a range of knowledge to her position, as well as a passion for her tribe's language and culture. Nikia enjoys working with people of all ages in her tribe and values the time she has spent with her elders learning about the culture and history of Chumash people. In her position, she's credited for starting the Samala Language Apprentice Program and in the development and passing of California Assembly Bill 544, CODO, that then became a new law in California as the teaching credential American Indian languages. Nice. In 2012, Ms. Zavala received her teaching credential in American Indian languages by the state of California in the Somala language. 
She also received her master's degree in cultural sustainability from Goucher College in Baltimore, Maryland. Nakia has served for the past eight years on the planning committee for the California Conference on American Indian Education, and she also serves on the California Living Language Circle Conference Planning Committee. She's a committed advocate of indigenous language and cultural preservation, and I, I would say Nakia and all of the elders, every one of you here tonight are just wonderful for the Park Service to work with. So thank you so much for being here. Um, tonight, Nakia is speaking on behalf of the tribe about Tucan Man, an individual who died and was buried on San Miguel Island about 10,000 years ago, one of the oldest discoveries of human remains in North America. Nakia will provide an overview and candid perspectives of the tribe, of their experience working with us, the National Park Service, on the complicated process required by the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, also known as NAGPRA, that led to Tucan Man's return to San Miguel Island. And Nakia asked me if I would give a little bit of background on NAGPRA and on the process that the Park Service went through in working with the tribe to be able to return to Cogman. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to give you some context, a little window into our world. NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, is a federal law passed in 1990 that requires federal agencies and federally funded institutions to do three really important things. And the intent of, and those are first, to return Native American human remains and cultural items subject to NAGPRA to either lineal descendants, Indian tribes, or Native Hawaiian organizations. First time in history that that's been a federal law. Second, we have to plan for situations where human remains and cultural items might be excavated on federal lands, and we have to be prepared to deal with any unexpected discoveries, and Tucan Man is just such an unexpected discovery. And third, and equally important, we consult with lineal descendants, Indian tribes, or Native Hawaiian organizations throughout the entire NAGPRA process. And so you can see the intent of NAGPRA is to address longstanding claims by federally recognized tribes for the return of human remains and cultural objects that were removed from prehistoric, historic, former, or current Native American homelands. And the process of implementing NAGPRA can be complex and controversial, and especially in this case, time consuming. And this is absolutely the case when we're dealing with very ancient remains, such as Tucan Man. So a little bit about the discovery. Tucan Man was discovered in 2005 on a remote coast of San Miguel Island. And Todd Bragey, the archeologist who's currently with San Diego State University, was the graduate student who worked with John Erlinson from University of Oregon, and they made that discovery. The cultural history of the Channel Islands is quite ancient. Archaeologists have documented, at least up to this point, at least 13,000 years of human history. And when we think of that in terms of generations, that's 600 generations of people living on what are now the islands that make up Channel Islands National Park. In fact, the evidence of long-term use by Native Americans is one of the six reasons that Channel Islands were set aside as a national park in 1980. So it's very important that we continue this protection and consultation because that's part of why we're here. And because the archeology span and cultural history are so important, we have a very active archeological inventory and research program. So I mentioned before that in 2005, Todd Bragey and John Erlinson discovered the remains of Tucan Man on San Miguel Island while documenting many, many early sites that were being damaged by erosion. And you can see how that erosion is kind of 
cutting through the landscapes. The discovery set in motion a period of intensive consultation, scientific and scholarly study, and federal deliberations under NAGPRA. Making this happen required lots of folks, lots of time, lots of energy. Most importantly, the time and energy of the Santa Inez Band. Their elders council, some of whom are here with us tonight, worked with the Park Service to ensure that we understood the cultural importance of Tucan Man and saw that the remains were treated with cultural sensitivity and respect. The NAGPRA process could not have happened without our research partners who provided the important scientific and scholarly information that helped the Park Service go through our deliberations and make the required determinations. And we at Channel Islands National Park, we certainly worked with our agency specialists across the country to make sure that our determinations were legally sound and that we didn't end up in court as some other agencies have. I mentioned earlier that NAGPRA decision making can be complicated and especially so when we're dealing with very ancient remains. And I just wanted to let you know that NAGPRA involves two key decisions related to remains. First, we have to confirm that the remains are those of a Native American individual. And this was very challenging in the case of Tucan Man because in 2004, the year before Tucan Man was discovered, remains dating to approximately 8,500 years ago, known as Kennewick Man, were determined not to meet NAGPRA's definition of Native American. So we were kind of hanging out there on this one. The second decision, once we've determined that remains are Native American, is whether or not we can demonstrate an affiliation between the remains and lineal descendants or a contemporary federally recognized tribe. This was also very difficult and ultimately it was a question that we couldn't answer. But we could determine that Tucan Man was Native American. Many in this room believe that he was also Chumash or ancestral Chumash. And in the end, after 13 years of study and consultation, his remains were finally reburied in 2008. So here is where Nakia picks up the story and shares the tribe's perspective. Okay, haku haku makduka nikia zavala kala palahulapu i kala washa kasho akatokiti maktuk Antonia Flores makalikshe Kathy Marshall mak anakjan Dolores Cross kaki nash. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Nakia Zavala. I am the cultural director for the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians, my tribe. Um, I've been asked here, yeah, to be a spokesperson, but I'm also sitting in front of my elders council um, relatives, um, Sam Cohen, um, who worked tirelessly, and um, we're so grateful for all the work that he did. Um, it's important to see that our family and our reservation isn't, isn't just our tribal family, but it's those that work hard for us and, and, and fight for our rights as well. Um, with that said, um, I'm honored to be here to speak on our, our ancestor, uh, Tukan Man. And yes, we do believe he is Chumash. We, we believe that with everything that we have. Um, and um, I was brought into the discussion in 2006, which technically was a year before I became the cultural director. Um, so I'm always grateful to be recognized and, and given the honor to have the opportunity to comment on such a, a significant find. Um, and, and when I sat in that meeting with Ann Houston and Kelly, Kelly Minnis and Russell, um, it, it was so emotional to hear in what way they found Kennewick Man, in which way he was buried, um, which is very significant to um, our ancestors on the islands um, being buried in a fetal style. And um, 
and very emotional. And I can tell then with our elders council that um, they were just charged with emotion. We needed to figure out what was to be done next. And the big decision was whether or not we should um, allow for him to be um, unearthed. Um, so we have a video we'd like to show. And I think it really does display our elders council at that time, um, how they really felt about what was going on and the experience that the tribe went through through this process. So if we could please show the video, that would be great. <laughs> For thousands of years, the Chumash people lived on these islands despite the harsh winds, treacherous coastline, and difficult living conditions. Today, it is hard to imagine how our ancestors lived and survived. In 2005, the archaeologist John Erlinson and one of his students traveled to San Miguel Island to do a site assessment. In the process of doing that assessment, we found lots and lots of sites like this. We found sites that spanned the last 10,000 years, and many of them hadn't been recorded. The problem is that they're eroding very rapidly and have been exposed relatively recently by erosion associated with grazing during the historic period, and so they're being destroyed very quickly. And about a year and a half ago, it was in the spring of 2005, we came down this arroyo and Todd spotted the top of a human cranium exposed, and it was just starting to be, it rode out of the, the uh, arroyo bank here. And that skull appeared to have a, has a slab, a rock slab immediately above it, which suggested that it was probably a burial. And it's extraordinary to find a human burial of this antiquity. Usually when we, we work on the Channel Islands, we see Shumash skeletons all the time. They're eroding out along the coast and we just leave them alone. Um, it's park policy, it's what the Shumash people want, and, and we're generally very supportive of that, of just leaving them alone. But this site is of such extraordinary antiquity. And, and so this, what we think is a burial, is, is very unusual in its age. It'd be older than Kennewick Man, uh, one of the oldest human skeletons in, along the Pacific coast of North America. This is a really important, potentially, component to understanding Shumash history and the really, really deep connections that the Shumash have to the islands and to the California coastal area. So before they could do that, to, to uncover it and, and remove it, they were good, good enough to come to us as the elders and, and ask us if we could, somebody from our group could go out there to, to do a blessing and, and, and do a ceremony of, there will be respect to this uh, uh, person that was an ancient uh, true man. So, <clears throat> the, the group, uh, the, the board asked if I would do it. I said yes, I would be proud to do it. I really would, would honor to do it. So we arranged for the trip out there. I went out there by uh, airplane and then they landed and then took a helicopter over to the site. I was all by myself, but I felt that being there that I was representing my tribe and my elders because I just seemed to know, feel it, the connection to this ancestor. So when I was there and I looked at that, you know, it stood in this creek, probably a 12 to 15 foot deep creek, and the skull was on the side of the, the wall of the creek, and you could see the, the skull sticking out amongst the rocks and stuff, but it was probably three or four feet below the surface, of, and I could see it, and I was all by myself. And, uh, I had taken some sage with me and some feathers and uh, tobacco and and I just felt so, you know, spiritual connected that I, I had never in my life before that had uh, ever felt that, uh, that I could actually sing a song, a prayer song. And I did and it just amazing feeling came over. Dr. Philip Walker, a physical anthropologist from the University of California, Santa Barbara, 
was part of the team that excavated the remains. We've learned a lot since leaving the island about who this person was and, and something about who this person might be related to. Our goal is to provide information to the National Parks Service and Secretary of Interior regarding the cultural affiliation of this person. Kennewick Man received that name from the archaeologist after the, the name that Europeans gave to the place where Kennewick Man was found. And when we're talking about Native American people, I think that the name should refer uh, to what Native Americans called the place where the person was found, the location. So we've started calling this person Tucan Man because that's the name, the Chumash name for San Miguel Island. When compared to other Native American remains found within the United States, Tucan Man falls within the five oldest ever discovered, younger than the 11,000 year old remains found at Arlington Springs on Santa Rosa Island, yet older than Kennewick Man from Washington State. The National Park Service has determined that Tucan Man is Native American and for these reasons, we are transferring his remains to the Chumash people. When they first came to us and were going to do the testing, they said it would take maybe a year, and then something happened and they had to go do it again and again. And it's been a total of 10 years, and I think it's time to bury him. It took a long time to get us to where we are today, but it was really building that trust relationship between the National Park Service and the Chumash people. And without your patience and your trust, we wouldn't be here today. And I wanna thank the tribe specifically for that. And I really wanna encourage you to learn more about your people, how they lived on the Channel Islands, how they moved back and forth between the islands, and really learn about your ancestors and what we as the National Park Service can do to help do that. Descendants of the Tucan Man were relocated to the mainland during the Spanish Mission era. Genealogy records show that these descendants intermarried with mainland Chumash people from the Santinez Valley and other regions. To me, when they discover something in the islands, because we do have relatives here that are from Santa Rosa Island, and it could be their relative. And the way he was buried showed me that he was native, that he wasn't anything else. Um, I do know that the Portuguese and the Cabrillo and a lot of Chinese, uh, Russians, probably passed by there. But I don't think the natives would have buried them their traditional way as they would to their own people. I believe things happen for a reason. Finding the Tucan Man happened around the time we were revitalizing our culture. For me, he symbolizes the traditions we almost completely lost, and his discovery goes along with our own rediscovery of our culture. And I think his story needs to be told. Welcome again to our viewers here in the United States. In 2005, the discovery of Tucan Man was considered to be one of the most significant archaeological finds in the Americas, and 15 years later, that has not diminished. As one of the five oldest Native American skeletons in North America, Tucan Man continues to draw intense interest from archaeologists, physical anthropologists, and geneticists who study early human migration. Museums around the country would love to have collections of this age, yet most do not because of how rarely they are discovered. For the Chumash people, Tucan Man is so important because it provides tangible evidence for our continued presence in this region over the last nine to 10,000 years. Very few tribes can say that. It's important that people know that they were intelligent people to be able to survive years and years, thousands of years, that the Sumas survived and we're still here. So I guess I don't think my talk could really let you know how our elders felt about the discovery as well as the reburial. Um, I do want to call Sam up um, to just enlighten us with some any extra information on the process, because I think it's really important. I think part of this discussion is 
um, what the tribe was going through. So I come from the cultural side um, as a cultural practitioner, and then there's this whole other side with policies and procedures, and, and really that's our challenge of walking in this world of being Chumash and culturally connected, but also understanding these, the, understanding these policies. And we need to know and be aware of because that's what protects our rights. Um, so Sam, I just, if you'd like to share anything about the process, I think um, waiting 10 years um, took a toll on the tribe. And um, so I just thought maybe you could offer something. Well, um there's uh, nothing more scintillating than having a lawyer talk to you. Uh, <laughs> five minutes. Five. <laughs> anyway, uh, around, prior to the discovery of Toucan Man, um, Kennewick Man was litigated, all right, in Washington State, and a group of, um, well, we would like to say less than enlightened archaeologists uh, argued that because Kennewick Man had no DNA evidence, it therefore was unaffiliated to the local tribes and therefore could not be repatriated by them. This uh, weighed heavily on the uh, decision making of the Park Service. And so when Toucan Man was found in 2005, even though the burial style was Chumash, um, they were hopeful that they could find DNA evidence to uh, uh, corroborate that this was a Chumash person. And um, because of the age of the find, the bones were, uh, what, what do you want to, were bleached and they were devoid of DNA. And, I, I, and it took 10 years because of really the, I don't want to say historic efforts of the Park Service, uh, but they really uh, spared uh, no effort to take Toucan Man, to various researchers throughout the world, all right, to research the DNA of the bones, to even find a, a smattering of DNA to provide that corroboration so that unenlightened archaeologists wouldn't litigate Toucan Man the same way they did in Kennewick Man. Now, because it took so long, I mean, and the tribe was very well, not always that patient, actually, with the Park Service. Uh, there were times when it was a little bit strained. But they actually passed new regulations under NAGPRA for unaffiliated human remains, which actually allowed the Park Service, after making a, a determination it was that the remains were Native American in origin, to make a, a determination to give the bones to the Chumash people for reburial. So, and as an unintended consequence of the extraordinary length of time it took, there was a change in law that actually worked in favor of the tribe and ultimately allowed the remains to be returned to the tribe for reburial on the island. And we actually had a good result and the reburial of one of the ancestors. You don't get that every day in this area of law to be entirely honest. Anyway, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Um, I do want to comment on um, the experience of reburying um, Tukan Man and um, myself, um, Kathy Marshall, um, Russell, um, and um, Laura. <laughs> um, all went out uh, for the reburial. And I can only speak for myself, Kathy, you're more than welcome to come up and share, but I think for me, I feel like as long as he was out um, of his resting place, we were mourning, I was mourning. And when we reburied him, it was almost like a celebration. Although it was sad, um, but it was a celebration for me because he was finally put back where he belonged. Um, he was no longer sitting in a box or a shelf or wh wherever he was, but he was finally in his resting place. Although our culture says when you go onto the spirit world, you go for three days to all the areas that you once lived and occupied and you make his way. So for us, he was already, he was already at that place, but now we needed to respect him and his remains and put them back where they belong. Um, so um, I can't speak enough to how comfortable we were with Russell and Laura there. Um, and, you know, I think this relationship is very important. And it speaks to how two different groups need to come together 
for the best for humankind and do and do you know make the best decision and that is to to put our ancestors back and to have this relationship with tribes that go beyond two entities but to have mutual respect um, empathy uh, being kind um, and just really get acknowledging and respecting um, the work that we're doing with one another um, so with that said Kathy I'd like to offer you the opportunity to speak she was right there with me. <laughs> I feel like Nakia pretty much said it all. It, we were in mourning, and we are in mourning for all of our ancestors that are still on shelves. Mm -hmm. And I come in at the tail end. I work for the elders, and I, we do the rebail, reburial together. So um, I am very happy and proud to have the relationship with the Park Services and that you guys respect us. And every time I go out there with you guys, it's always been a great experience. And this one in particular was a great experience. And she was right. When we left there, it, it did feel like a calm. And it was a great experience. Thank you. Um, so we're looking forward to continuing this work. Um, the group that was there before, Ann, Russell, um, you know, Kelly, they're all retired, living the happy retired life. <laughs> and we have this new, one, new wonderful group that we're working with, and they're definitely carrying on the foundation that you set uh, for all of us. So, um, so thank you so much. And we do have a lot more work. There's a lot of ancestors that, are, that still need to be put back where they belong. And um, you're one agency that the tribe works with, and, and a perfect example of a relationship. So with that said, I'd like to um, open it up to any questions anybody may have. Sam, don't go too far. <laughs> yes, right here. You um, mentioned the particular way in which you guys found him married. Oh, sorry. Huh. Hi. Um, you mentioned the particular way in which you found him buried. I'm wondering if that's something you can share with us, or is that a private... Um, situation well I think um, books have been written um, oh. and um, it's very um, specific on, on our ancestors and how they were buried out in the islands which is in a fetal style with their head pointed towards the west oh, yeah. interesting thank you <laughs> so how much was learned about this person? I think a lot of information was learned. I, I don't, you know, particularly want to share too much about him. Um, but, you know, it, it, when you go into scientific studies, I was learning things I never knew before. As I mentioned, I don't come from that scientific background, but more of cultural. And, you know, and at that point, we were getting so much different information on the type of food he ate possibly where he could have came from. And it kind of went all over the place. Um, I think what I learned the most was that you can't completely depend on science. <laughs> I'm not lying. <laughs> we kept getting readings and this and that, and we're going, and what, you know, <laughs> Russell, what's going on here? You know, um, but I think that's, I mean, I think that's very clear. I mean, I think that's where you see, you know, traditions and culture that have been in place for thousands of years and passed down you know, we're reading information that's written down in 1919, and um, but that's shared from many years before, and then we're getting scientific information, and it just and doesn't always just mesh together, and that's where we see um, we lean upon our ancestors for guidance. Yes. Aloha, mahalo. I am Native Hawaiian. I'm living oh, on your aloha. land. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> and I'm. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to stand here and so humbled to stand in front of you today. Um, I think it's vital that the people that are living here now understand whose land we are on, mm -hmm. understand to the degree in which we can, your culture, understand the EV, the bones that are beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned so many things that resonated with me. Um, I just came back from Mauna Avakea on the island of Hawaii where we're standing to protect our water and our ancient grave sites up there too. And um, I, I think, you know, with mention to science, uh, we have to 
really understand that, yes, Western science, and I, I have a doctorate degree, I'm a nurse, you know, I, I get science, but Western science is, is a colonized way of being, right? It came from that. And yes, it's not always congruent with the things that you find as a native person. That ancient wisdom that comes from our ancestors is something that cannot sometimes be quantified in the Western and colonial scientific model. And so um, I appreciate this gentleman when he was talking on the, that was you, yes, sir, on the, on the screen. You were so humble and you were so, you were so kind which you mentioned, and you were so sort of willing to say that, you know, we are willing to help you with whatever it is, even if it's something that we don't know. So again, thank you for having this, and thank you for allowing us to learn, because again, we are, we are visitors in your aina. Mahalo. Mahalo. Kakinash. Did you find any artifacts with him? Or uh, pieces of pottery or beads or was no. there? No, no just, just him. OK, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I was just curious um, that no DNA had been found. I mean, it, it wasn't, it was, I guess, I just wanted to clarify that it was more how he was buried, the burial, that determined that he was Chumash. He wasn't determined that he was Chumash. We believe he's Chumash. OK. He okay. was identified as Native American. Native American? Yeah. OK. All right, thank you. But he's Chumash. <laughs> <laughs> Chumash word, Kaila. That means that's all. <laughs> Chumash, Kaila, that's all. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Okay. Oh, Lola. Sure. Um, I don't know anything about science, but all of the things that have been happening with the Kennewick man and the Tukon man. I started rereading about the Kennewick man because I had heard that he, his skull was measured and it didn't match any of the modern natives in his area. And that was a factor for them making a decision that he wasn't related to any of these. Same thing happened with, the, with our Tukon man. The scientists there are also measured. Now this is, they're, they're measuring someone that's almost 10,000 years old, to a modern Chumash. I said, that can't even be considered because there's so many thousands of years that went by. And so when they couldn't pull, I believe, if I'm correct, Sam, they couldn't get any, they tried to take some um, tissue from the tooth and have a DNA, and the DNA did not, they, it, was, it, wasn't in, it was insufficient material, they couldn't do it. but. Um, I, I went to listen to some lectures on um, the DNA. A young woman was giving a presentation and talked about all the new methods they have. Very complicated. So when she finished, I went up to her and I asked her, if you can't get DNA, would you determine who this person belongs to by measuring their skull? And she said, absolutely not. We don't use those methods. So that gave me gratification, because they were using that to say, he's not part of our tribe, because he doesn't meet those, measure, those same standards that they did for the modern Chumash, which I totally didn't agree upon. So yeah, we do believe that he is a Chumash person. Thank you, Lola. Um, I think that just kind of speaks to some of the conversations that we had at me different meetings with the elders and, um, and some information that I think was very really hard for them to hear based off a measurement of his head that he, that he wouldn't be Chumash. Um, um, so with that said, I, I, we, we want to end here. And I think um, I just want to say that um, I feel very honored to do this work for my, my people. Um, it's, sorry, I'm gonna get a little emotional.
you know, when you go to places and you're <laughs> taking your ancestors off walls and you're putting them somewhere safe so you can take them home. You know, it doesn't, it's not work you take lightly and you have to pray and ask Creator for guidance. Um, we sing to them. I mean, we've reburied males, females, babies, you know, and they've been on shelves for many years. So I can't speak to that experience and, and the honor my people give me to do this. You know, we talk about the science and all these things going back and forth, but you know, our people are doing it. Our council, our chairman, our council members, we're fighting. They're fighting. Our elders are fighting. We hear things we don't want to hear. We have great people like Sam that works hard for us. You know, we have our, our warriors that are with our tribe doing this work. And it's nothing I want to raise myself up for doing. It's something I do with humility. And it's not easy. I know Kathy's right there with me. And it's not comfortable, but yet we know it must be done. And I can't speak enough to working with the different agencies and making it easy for us. Because we're dealing, it, dealing with it on another side as well. You know, our spiritual side, honoring the ancestors, caring for them, and ensuring they're, they're put back in, in the right way. And that's all led by our ancestors. It's all led by them. Um, so I apologize for getting so emotional, but, but this is really our experience, and this is what we, what we are grateful, but yet very emotional, and it is hard for us. So with that, Kaki Nash, Kaki Nalan, thank you, and I'm grateful to, to you all especially my elders. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your story. We're very grateful that you came tonight to, to help us understand your experience. It's very challenging, uh, and it's something that we're in together. So, and thank you all for being here, especially all you who made the trek down from Santa Ynez. <laughs>